so welcome to the Malibu Barbie Dream Stage. And I am Megan Malloy. I'm a data analyst at Datadog, and I'm going to be talking about promoting data-driven product design. So first, we'll go over product analytics at Datadog, how we're getting this product analytics data, how we're exposing it, and how we're actually facilitating the exploration. So product analytics at Datadog. For those of you who don't know what Datadog is, it's a SaaS platform for monitoring application performance, logs, and infrastructure metrics. And you can also set up alerts to get a notification in your email or through a Slack channel if a metric crosses a certain threshold. And within Datadog, we have the internal analytics team, of which I am a member. And we are providing data to the other teams at Datadog so that they can answer questions about the business. And on the internal analytics team, there's sort of two halves to it. We have our data engineers who collect all that data. They clean it up for us, load it into Redshift, and then the data analysts get the fun part where they get to play with this data and actually apply it to business use cases. So what is product analytics? This is gonna be all I'm talking about for the next 30 minutes, so we should have a common definition here. So we're talking about using user interaction data within the application to understand the user's behavior. So this is tracking things like clicks and page views and keyboard shortcuts, and we'll go into more detail in how we get that data later. And why do we want to use product analytics data? So first of all, we can use this to improve the app. There are a couple ways that we can do this using the product analytics data. So first, we can identify sticking points. So we can follow a user through a certain workflow in the app. And we can see, did they complete a certain step, but they didn't go on to hit that Save button? So that can help us identify where are their challenges in our app and areas for improvement. And then we can also find power users. So if this is a new feature we just rolled out, Maybe there's only a couple of people who have discovered it so far. So we can contact these power users and get some early feedback to make sure that that feature is as best as possible for all of the future users. And then ultimately, with our new and improved app, we'll be able to keep our customers happy. And then hopefully, the goal at the end of the day is to get more money from those happy customers. And so this data would be used by our customer success managers, our product managers, our product designers, in order to make these changes to the app and get the feedback from our customers. So how are we actually collecting this data? So one thing that we considered when we were looking into product analytics data was element level tracking. So this is implementing code on every single button in the app that you would want to track. And there were a couple problems that we considered with this approach. First is it can require a lot of setup time. It might only be one or two lines of code, but if we have to put that on the hundreds of buttons throughout our app, that time can really add up. And the other thing is that it's error prone. So somebody might forget to add that code to a certain element, or they might make a strategic decision that this isn't something we care to track, and then later on down the line, if we find out that we do actually want to track that, then we've lost all of that historical data. So we'd much rather have that data up front and be able to access it later, even if it's something that right now we don't anticipate needing. So instead, we decided to track everything. So we implemented a JavaScript tracker from a third-party tool called Snowplow, and they actually have a booth in the sponsor's booth here, so you can get more details from them there. Uh, so this JavaScript tracker is implemented at the root of the document, and it's able to capture all page views and all clicks automatically. So we don't have to implement any code on a new button if we create a new button. It's automatically going to be captured with the HTML that defines that button. And the one exception to this is if there's any sort of a custom event, then we do have to implement a little bit of code there. So a custom event would be like a keyboard shortcut. One that we have in our application is copying and pasting tiles on a dashboard. So you could take a chart from one dashboard, put it in another. So on that command C definition, where we're saying what, does, what behavior does this shortcut have, we would just add four lines of code in order to track that. And that is very manageable because there's only so many keys on your keyboard, only so many keyboard shortcuts people can remember. So this is not something that we have to update all the time. And now that we have all of that data, we're taking that data, storing it in S3. It goes through our ETL pipeline that our data engineers manage. And we're using Luigi and Spark to clean up the column names, connect it to other data sets to enhance them. And then it gets loaded into Redshift. And then, ultimately, we plug Looker into our Redshift instance. 
And the tables that we're exposing in Redshift, so our first table is packed app events. This is pretty simple. It's one row for every event that happens. So when you click on a button, that's one row. When you land on a new page, that's another row. And so every page view, every click, every custom keyboard shortcut is its own row in this table. So this table is giant. So for that reason, we also created backed app page view. A lot of times the questions that our users have aren't necessarily about clicking on a specific button. It's about what areas of the app are they using in general, and this can be tied just to page view data instead. So in fact app page view, we have just one row per page view, and we're doing aggregations of the fact app events data. So every time you land on a page, we'll have full details about what that page was, and we'll have the aggregation of how many clicks did you make while you were on this page, or how many total actions did you complete on this page. So we can see engagement, but not the full details of what elements did you engage with. So this can answer a lot of questions a lot more quickly. And just to give you an idea of the scale of these tables, every single night we're adding a couple million rows to fact app events, and our fact app page view table is only adding a couple hundred thousand. So this is a much more performant table if we can get people to use fact app page view if they don't need the event level data. And then in our data model, we're using a pretty basic star schema. So these fact tables that I just mentioned all have foreign keys that allow us to tie them to some of our other dim tables, which are showing static features of different parts of our data set. So we have details on the user, on the page, we can put it into a higher level category, on the organization, that's our customer data. So if we wanna do any filtering by the user's geography or by the org's billing plan, then it's really easy to connect these extra tables and enhance that fact table data with these. So now we have all this great data from Snowplow. Our data engineers did a great job lumping it all together and throwing it into these Redshift tables. How are we actually exposing it so that people are able to use it? So the first thing that we're doing is those two tables I mentioned from Redshift. We're exposing them in very basic explorers, just taking the columns from those tables and exposing them as dimensions with a couple of aggregate measures. And from that, we are able to make a few dashboards and draw a few insights already. So you'll notice on this dashboard, I think some of you probably already saw this map fizz. Um, Datadog actually went public pretty recently, so they're very sensitive about showing any performance data. So in all of these screenshots that I show you from Looker, there's no axes or anything, and all of the data is anonymized. So I promise it looks a lot more useful in prod. Uh, <laughs> but you can see a little bit here of what we're able to put together just with those tables that I mentioned in Redshift. So you can see usage of different product areas based on page views that are hitting those product categories. You can see total numbers of how many users are actually coming to the app, how many distinct companies does that include, and then you could have an actual map viz of the areas that those page views were coming from. So that's a lot already, but one thing we don't have is that deeper analysis that I was talking about earlier of being able to identify an entire workflow and find where people aren't completing that workflow. So the example I'll keep walking through for the remainder of our time here is our monitor creation process. So a monitor in Datadog is the alert that gets sent to your email or to your Slack channel. And to set this up, there's basically three steps. First, you would go to the monitor creation page. Second, you would pick a monitor type. So we have a type that would be tied to a specific metric. You could set a threshold when you wanna be alerted about that metric. Or maybe you wanna use a forecast monitor type, which would tell you when you are predicted to cross a metric in the near future. So there's a lot of different monitor types that you could potentially click on. And then after you pick one of those, you fill out all the details and you hit a save button to save the monitor. So that's a three-step workflow that we might wanna analyze and find out are there people who are picking a monitor type and then they're not hitting save. For other companies, if it's like a retail company, maybe the workflow you would be interested in would be something like going to a product page, hitting the add to cart button, hitting the checkout button would be the three steps you're interested in. So anybody who has an application that people are interacted, interacting with should be able to identify some sort of multi-step workflow that they're interested in. And you could apply similar logic to that workflow. So the way that we're able to do this, using those tables that exist in Redshift, we're creating a derived table 
in Looker. And we're able to use the power of Looker Liquid in order to make sure that this derived table is very performant. So in this derived table, we'll go through the code and hopefully I won't lose you there, but this derived table, the general idea is we're left joining that backed up events table to itself multiple times. The reason we decided to approach it this way is because we can avoid windowing functions and having to do everything at a row level. Now we're just adding on columns. So it's a little bit easier to interpret and to piece together. And then we're also using the Looker UI filters to reduce the subquery size by using Looker Liquid. So we can put in where clauses that reference the UI filters and reduce our subquery size. So here is a generalized view of what that would look like. So we'll have filter only fields that help define what are the steps. So for each of these steps, maybe filter one is the event action, whether it's a click or a page view, and filter two is the page that it happened on, the page URL. So you would define what is step one by using those two filters. You would do the same thing for step two, define it based on those two filters. And then ultimately we would visualize the events count from those. So now we'll get into the code. I'll try not to spend too much time here. Uh, you can see we're selecting just a couple of things to keep it simple here. We could expand this query as needed, but I think it's better to keep it simple for demonstration purposes. So we're only selecting the user ID and the time that the event happened. And this is for defining only step one. So now in this red box, you'll see that we're adding these condition statements to pull filters from the UI. So those filter fields that you have filtering your explore we're able to reference both the values that you have as well as the comparative statements that you have. So the reason we're using this condition term is because that lets us pull, if you're using an equals statement, then it'll pull an equals. If you're using a contains, it'll transform that to a like statement. And to see this in effect, here's what somebody might put as the filters for step one in the explore. And then if we look at the SQL behind that, you can see with filter one, it's using equals to filter text and that's because the user put in is equal to in their comparison there. And for filter two, we're using contains, and so that gets converted into a like statement. So this is very powerful that we're able to give the user the flexibility to use different comparative statements here. Now we're gonna look at even more code. So we've defined step one, we put that in a query, it slapped a step one label on it. Now we're into step two, and you can see in step two, we're still selecting the same things, and these, this where clause, now we're referencing the step two filters instead of the step one filters, because this is a whole different step. And we also have this conditional logic wrapped around step two. So this isn't as clear for a two-step process, but if you can imagine this being a three or four-step process, maybe we don't necessarily have steps three or four defined. And so we wanna make sure we're not doing any unnecessary joins. So this if logic lets us say, only do this left join if somebody has actually put in the filters to define what is step two. And if they didn't define step two, no point in doing the extra join. So to take a look at what this looks like in a live example in an explore, you can type a filter in there and you'll see that in that SQL code, it pops out this left join. Because now that step two is defined, it goes ahead and it meets that, that if condition and it populates the left join for step two. And when you undo it, it takes that left join away. So now that we have step two defined, we need to add the join logic. And so here, the logic that we're hard coding is that the Datadog user ID needs to be the same in both steps because we wanna follow one user through a workflow. And the other thing that we're hard coding is step one has to come before step two because we want this to be a one directional workflow. And then we add this additional logic here so we have this thing called conversion window minutes, which is a little bit of a confusing concept. The idea is that there might be a button that exists with a very similar HTML definition in a bunch of different places throughout the app. So a save button is a great example of this. You save tons of things throughout our app. You would save if you created a monitor, you would also save if you edited a monitor. So it could appear to be the same button. So what we wanted to do is make sure that this is reasonably sure that it's part of the same workflow, and the way we're doing that is by making sure it happened close in time to the other steps. But we didn't wanna just hard code a certain time frame in there. 
because different workflows in our app can take different amounts of time. Setting up a monitor should only take a couple of minutes, but going through our interactive documentation could potentially take hours as you're going back and forth between AWS and the documentation. So we wanted to leave this flexibility up to the user. So now that we have those two steps joined, we can go ahead to our final select statement. So we'll take all the stuff from step one, the user ID and the timestamp. And then for step two, again, we wanna make sure we're not selecting anything if step two wasn't defined. Because if step two wasn't defined, then we don't have that left join. Like the step two data doesn't exist at all. So here we're adding that logic to say don't select it if it doesn't exist. And then within that, if step two has been defined and does exist, we wanted to add one more consideration here. So potentially step two could be completed multiple times for each step one. So in the case of creating a monitor, you would land on the monitor creation page and then you could potentially click through several different monitor types. And this is pretty common because it can be a little confusing what the difference is between the different monitor types. So you might click through three or four before you pick which one you're actually interested in. So here we're just going to take the first instance of when you clicked on a step two element. And moving on to what this actually looks like in the Explorer and how a user interacts with this data. So this is what the process looks like for creating a monitor. This is our monitor creation page. You would click one of these monitor types on the left side. So that would be, right now, forecast is highlighted in blue. But you could pick any of these monitor types. Then you would fill out the details and hit that save button on the bottom right. So that's what the process looks like that we're trying to recreate through this Explore. And this is the Explore we have. So where do we start? An easy place to start is what do we actually want to see in the end visualization? So let's pick the measures we want to expose. That would be the event count at each step in this workflow. So we have those three event counts selected. We can add a couple preliminary filters here as well. So the conversion window that I mentioned before, this should be a pretty quick turnaround to get a monitor set up. So we set that to less than four. And then we also put a filter on the start week of when the workflow was initiated. And we like to keep that in a pretty recent time frame because maybe the app went a drastic overhaul in the last year or something like that. So we don't want to compare a totally different version of the app because maybe this feature was not very discoverable under a different design of the app. So we want to make sure that we're comparing recent versions of the app. And step one is pretty easy to define because step one is just a page view on a specific page. So here we can filter for the event action is a page view and the page URL contains monitors slash create because that's the base URL of our monitor creation page. But now we get to step two. So on the left you can see all of the dimensions that we have as filters in our Explorer. And on the right you can see the monitor that you would be selecting in the app. And how do you piece these two things together? There's words like event label, event property, event category. Those are pretty meaningless to most people. Luckily, our friends at Snowplow created this debugger that you can add into Chrome. And you can walk through this workflow yourself and see all of the data that it's recording for each of these events. So here's the example of landing on the home page, clicking on the new monitor, and you'll see on the right that Snowplow Analytics Debugger tab loads a structured event because you clicked on a button, and it also loads a page view because you landed on that new page. And now if we're on that new monitor creation page and you click on a monitor type, again it registers a structured event in the Snowplow Debugger. And when you expand that, you can see all of the data that it's collecting. So this is a ton of data just for one click event. And if we scroll down to the custom structured event tracking, that's where all of those weird words are. And they match exactly to what we have in Looker, so it's really easy to compare between the debugger and between Looker. And so we can see here event action is click. That's an easy one. You probably would have gotten that without the debugger. But the thing that's really interesting here is in the event label, you can see it says JS tab metric. And that's because we clicked on a metric monitor type. So that's the place that I would focus for my filter to define what did you actually click on. Uh, one more piece of information here that you get from some troubleshooting is that JS tab metric is specifically referring to the metric monitor. If we wanna look at clicks on all monitor types, just make sure you get rid of that word metric. 
So when we put this into our filters, you'll see that for step two, we're using the event action as a click, that the event label contains JS tab, and then I also like to put in the page URL again just to make sure it wasn't on a totally different page. And we'll skip defining step three. It's a similar process of back and forth between the debugger and looker. But ultimately when you run it, you get this funnel analysis and you can see how many times did someone complete step one. Once they completed step one, how many of those events went on to step two and how many went on the full way to hit save on that monitor. But you'll notice something very drastic here that between step two and step three, we're losing a ton of people. Why aren't people able to save these monitors? So we want, might wanna arm our customer success managers or our product managers with some more information to help troubleshoot this. So because of our star schema, this is joined to all of our user data. So we're able to pull in the user's email address and the user's name, and we can filter for users who completed step two but didn't complete step three. And so here you can see those details about those users, Step two is greater than zero, and step three is equal to zero. So now that we have that, there's one thing you might be noticing, since we're all in the data industry, I just showed a bunch of email addresses, and those were all office characters, so I think that's probably not PII, uh, but in real life, those are actual people's email addresses, and we have a responsibility to handle those appropriately. So we wanna make sure that only the right people are able to see that level of detail. So we are managing permissions at a model level to keep people from seeing sales or finance data, but for product analytics, we want it to be used throughout the entire business. We want everybody to have access to it. But PII is something that we might not want everybody to have access to, because then we have to hunt them down if we get a GDPR request, and we don't wanna have to try to track down everybody at the company. So we're using user attributes for this. So we have a can see emails attribute. By default, this is set to no. We can toggle it on if somebody has proper requirements that they would really need to see this. And then we call that access grant at the model level and ultimately call it in the view on the email dimension. And what this ends up looking like is that the user, uh, if, you're, if you have the proper permissions, then you'll be able to see email in the field selector. And you'll also be able to see email in the results. Everything looks just like it did before, but if I have the right permissions and I send it to somebody who doesn't, then they won't be able to see that field in the field selector, they won't be able to see it in the results or the visualization, and they'll see this error message. So that makes sure that only the right people are actually seeing this PII. And now that we've exposed all the data, we have a lockdown so that nobody's doing anything they shouldn't, how do we actually get people to use this data and to learn about it? So we had pre-built some content like that weird anonymized dashboard that I showed you before and just to get ideas going for different product areas. So we started with that and we sent an announcement to the entire company to tell them product analytics is live, here's how it could be useful to you and linking out to that pre-built content. And then we also added a link on our homepage. So we have a custom markdown homepage so we were able to add some HTML to make it in a little yellow box so it would stand out a bit. And we added a link to another markdown page that had a full list of details about what is product analytics and again, links to that pre-built content. We also started sending newsletters to the individual teams in our company. So our internal analytics team of 12 people serves all of the different teams in the entire company. There's a lot of different needs within those different teams. So we customize these to those teams to tell them why product analytics is specifically useful to them and links to any dashboards that we had built for them. And then the last thing we did was we made an e-learning site. So this is just a Google site and we use the Google suite so it was pretty easy to set up with that. And we added some videos of how to use the Snowplow debugger, how to map the Snowplow debugger fields to what's in Looker and how to ultimately build a funnel analysis. So that's a great place to divert people so we don't have to keep copying and pasting answers in Slack all the time. And in terms of our return on this, so we've actually had pretty good usage of our e-learning site. You can see the big spike that's right before May. That's when we announced product analytics through the email to the whole company. So that's why there was such a huge spike there. But the thing we're really proud of is that we have 92 average users in Looker every day, and 63 of those are using product analytics to some extent. So this is very much embedded in the daily workflows of our internal customers. 
and we've had some great feedback from around the company. So I mentioned that product managers are a huge consumer of this data, as well as customer success managers. The engineering department's also very excited about this. And you can see one engineer even called out specifically that fact that we're not using that element level tracking anymore, and we're able to capture everything automatically. So people are very excited about that as well. 